So how many years now then have you been dealing with China? Uh, yes, yeah, seven years. Seven years. And and you yourself have been there? I've been there, yeah. I go every year. Yeah, I go Just once to have, keep the relationship keep with the Keep the factory. relationship. Uh, they, they take you more seriously once you go there. It's like a respect thing when you go there. Mm-hmm. They, they believe you're serious and then when you start, they just want volumes. You know, because we import over 200 containers a year, you just say, you put an order in for, for five, they go, oh, do you want seven? You know, like they just want yeah. that. They just want more like because it's all – volume and when we first went um you know we we sort of went with a couple of leads but some of it was just you know from people that because they always send in your emails to the different factories saying we can provide you with temporary yeah. fencing so um some of the best websites mm. were the worst factories so you, you know you get these websites and the best communication and then they were the worst factories with quality the setup you know safety all that so the only way to really know is to go you got, got to go there Sometimes you're talking to the bosses of the factory, but you're talking through a translator. So it's hard to get to know them. Like we're sitting down here talking now. You can get a gauge and get to know someone. When you're talking through a translator, it's sort of hard to build that relationship as well. And it's, things are lost in translation. So you, even though you might be saying this to that person, and it, even when you're not talking business, even when you're just talking generally, you know things are lost. So, um, But we've had some funny times. We've had some pretty uh boozy lunches or dinners with them through a translator and that is a funny experience they like love to drink the yeah, chinese yeah, yeah they, they really do it. and they look after you do they make you cheese that they cheese yeah, every gumbo. what gumbo. is it yeah, yeah it's gumbo. like every yeah. 10 seconds and yeah, everyone yeah. Shoot, shoots a, or yeah. skulls whatever they have yeah. i've had that experience yeah i thrived yeah yeah that's it well it's been good you know and um i negotiated under that experience yeah exactly that's it well that's what you basically do you wake up in the morning going what what did we agree on last night yeah um so and we initially we sort of had a middleman when we first were establishing the relationships over there and that was always hard because you've got a middleman that you're not talking direct and you've got the you've got the uh translation problem plus a middleman so we cut that out oh, a fair few years ago now and we just deal direct with the factories yeah, so no, yeah. you don't want the middleman. You want to go. Direct. Yeah, yeah. You don't. You don't want the middleman. If you're not buying much product and it's inconsistent, the middleman works well because mm-hmm. they might be sourcing for a few other different people and they've got the relationship and they can help you out. But once you start doing a lot of product, importing a lot of product, you want to be dealing direct with the the boss. You know, because a lot of people in start importing, they they get their first. They send over a sample, get the first container, it's great. And the second or third, they do a big order and it's a pretty crappy product. And then you, and you've paid up front, but you can't do anything about it. Like that's it. It's gone. Yeah, you, you're gonna you, sue, you can't sue China. Exactly. So um, a lot of our stuff now, we've got pretty good guarantees. If there is some dodgy stuff, they'll they'll replace it. And you know, but that's just about building the relationship and over time. And also you know. you've got the leverage of having a lot of quantity of product coming out a lot of people don't have yeah exactly that, yeah. And, and and a lot of people have been burnt not just from temporary fencing but just in general mm. just buying from uh china but you you have to these days because there's nowhere else we've looked at other places to source it like vietnam or taiwan but they end up buying the steel from china anyway so you, you know like in you might be getting the ed product made um but you still got you're still sourcing the core product yeah. from from China. So it's like a catch twenty two. You know, it's very hard to do it correctly there, but you have to do it there yeah. in order to compete in the market. We used to manufacture it here, and we one of the last to do the Australian made, and mm-hmm. we we wanted to keep it, but then after a while, we just couldn't compete. Yeah. So we so we did that about seven years ago. We changed. Yep. But we've sourced um yeah three different factories um that we source off now uh, for our different products. We've established those relationships now, but it, it does take, you know, five to seven years to get the right factories. Like you could have a, a factory that's supplying you for a year or two with good product and then it just slowly starts to slip and you've got to be onto it all the time. You got why, to be, why is that? Why do they do that? It's sometimes communication. Sometimes it's they thinking you want cheaper. They don't – you've got to really say quality. Don't want cheaper quality because they always can say I can make it cheaper, but the, when, it, when it's cheaper the quality drops. Mm. Even though we might be buying the same product over and over again, I send the drawing every time with the specifications. Like never not – because at one time you, you do it, it could just not do it to what you said. So they're very good at following drawings and, and being specific like that. But you always, yeah, just got to – I send it every single time with exactly what we expect. So you need to be super specific. Yeah, we've learned lessons and no matter who imports, you, no matter how well you do it, you get – ripped off on a few containers over the time and you, you get some really, you know, 
crappy product. Like no matter how well you do it, everybody's had those experiences. You've got to always be checking that. You've got to be checking it before it, before it leaves and when it lands as well. Like, you know, so, so would you have people there that have to check it? You know, yeah, we get we get it uh, checked from when it's there uh, with photos of you know all the different gauges and and the, the galvanizing all that stuff before it leaves as it's leaving in in there and then when we get it here we we check it as well. When we first went, one of these we all seen this product get loaded for New Zealand, the temporary fence panels, blocks and clamps, and it was terrible quality. And they were loading it into this container to, and then you could tell these people would have just made probably the first container or second container that they've ordered yeah. and as they were trying to load it they couldn't even load it in, and it was just breaking like all the worlds were popping off the panels and it was just breaking as they were driving so imagine you know traveling on the sea get loading unloading a container and then trying to unload it in new zealand they probably would have got 50 percent of their product that they could have reused and you know you've just paid x amount and they, don't, they don't send you back the money do they no that's it no like way. you pay up front like you you got to pay so if someone does want to go to china and get saying how can you kind of What's the best way you – what's the best thing you can do to kind of maximise your your chance of having a successful quality purchase? The whole manufacturing process, you want to take them to take photos. So, you know, as they're doing it, if you can test it, like some products you can't test. Like so, for instance, the the steel, you can test the gauge, how how thick the mill is of, of the gauge of the mesh or the, or the pipe. Uh, and the galvanising, you can test uh, with a machine to test show you the galvanising. But for instance, the plastic, they for the blocks, they say that it's UV rated, but you can't test that plastic until it starts fading after six months or a year, which they mm. guarantee, say, five to ten, depending on which factories you buy from. I would always recommend get photos through the whole process, get photos as they're loading it. Then once it's landed, you know, take photos as you're unloading it. So if there's any damages, you can sometimes get – if you reorder, they, they might replace – just say there's five damages or ten damages in that container. They'll send additional. Yeah, they'll, they'll send additional or for the next container. But they won't give you refunds. They just say the next yeah. container you okay. order will we'll, we'll replace that. That's, and, good. That's good knowledge. And sometimes you need to ask for that or push it because sometimes they'll be just like, oh, it got damaged in freight, you know. Had nothing uh, to do with us. Yeah, but yeah. we've proven, okay, this is impossible to be damaged from freight. Like look at this um, from the photos you took. from the. So you just got to have that process. You got to have that point of difference, and for us, is the personalised service. Where the first things on the job, where the last things off, a lot of the time. So that they're critical points in the job because we got to establish the site. Um, if you don't establish a site on time, it's it's costing them money, and you know slows them down. Slows them down. Um, and same thing at the end of the job. If they got to get sign off and they get they get a fence out so they can get their last payment. If you're not on time and you're not, you know, take a week or two days or three days to. Not to take it out. It's a small part of the job. It's still a very important part of the job. Um, and as I said, we're the first thing on and the last things off, which helps with building the relationships in the in the in the construction industry because you know them from the start of the job to the end of the job. Some people sort of in other trades in the construction, they're on the first three days and then they don't speak to the that project manager, that CA, um, for twelve months. And then they f- they're sort of forgotten, you know, because like the next job, whereas we're through that whole job, relocating fans, picking it up at the end. So that's good in terms of building that personalised uh, relationship as well. But and what do you do to actually provide the personal service? Initially it was just me, right? So uh, it was that was our personalised service. So mm. they dealt with me. They rang me. Uh, they rang me directly on the mobile if they wanted stuff book- booked in or – if they wanted stuff um, relocated or needed an urgent job or needed panels, because sometimes it's very reactive. They might need, for a safety issue, 20 panels there now or in 7 a.m. in the morning. So we've built that by being able to do that and doing anything that we could. Like I, back in the early days, I used to go out and do it if our crews couldn't do it. So like I would be going out there and jump in a ute and do it myself if, mm. if a customer needed it. So that's where we were... They've sort of seen me do that so then they understand. Now it's just building the team to understand that. So as you expanded, so as you grew, obviously you were no longer the person that they were able to call or could call. Yeah. And so a big part of it was trying to teach team and find a team that can deliver the same thing, act as owners yeah. though. It's hard when you own the business, your business, to then try to uh, try to build that and, and have people have that same care and – We've got that team now. Like we've got so the girls in the office, our operations manager, who's also my mate who I grew up with from young age and he's been with us for um, 13 years now. Um, just by seeing me 
service customers and, and talk to customers and just understanding that, yes, we can do it and figure it out later. You know, that's the sort of personalized service that we try to provide. And, and just simple things like calling the customer the day before, telling them what time you're going to be there, being there on that time. And then if you are late or you've got truck problems, like things happen, you ring them and tell them, don't let them ring you first. Like mm. you get there, you tell them, you tell them before they find out it's a problem. Just go, look, we're going to be an hour late because of this. It's sort of simple stuff, but uh, customers appreciate that. Like, you know. But you say it's simple, but most companies don't do it. That's yeah. the thing. Wait, when we say we're there, we're there. If there's a reason that we can't be, we're going to make sure you know in advance. We're yeah. not just going to rock up late. Even to recently, like some of our customers have seen uh, John, our operations manager, and myself out there and doing fencing if we have to, if it means getting the job done or helping out a customer. And they just can't believe that we, we would go out and do it because they go, I don't expect you to. They feel and embarrassed. Company, then. Yeah, they yeah. feel embarrassed then. But I go, well, this is, was our only option to make sure that we could do it for you because all our other guys are under the palm. They're busy. They're doing all other jobs. But we wanted to make sure that we could do this for you. So here we are. 